All right, guys, how's it going? A few weeks ago, I think when I was doing my 10,000 subs video, I talked about the builders in the building and there has been ongoing building works for the past three weeks. And this is making it really difficult for me to get videos done in a timely fashion. So that's why it's been a week since I released a video. In actual fact, during this last week, I've taken the chance to get some work done outside of YouTube and it's just something that I need to do as I grow the channel. That said, I have been working on videos. Sometimes they don't always go great though, especially when I'm learning about a new topic. And it's been like that this week. However, I always did intend tend to do videos like this one where I basically go over some of the questions that are at the forefront of our minds and some of the questions that pop up in my videos. Simply put, an analysis video can easily take a week. A video like this maybe takes one whole day. So let's get on with it. There are some questions that I get asked a lot more than others. And one of those is, should I go with the i7-6700K or the i7-5820K? In other words, the quad core with hyperthreading or the six core with hyperthreading. In my Buy Smart $2000 video, I went with the six core. But I'm gonna take a closer look at this right now because there are more benchmarks starting to show up. Right, over at Eurogamer.net, Core i7 Faceoff, which is the fastest gaming CPU? They have put the 6700K up against the 5820K and the 5960X. So this is exactly the sort of information that we really need to know. Now, I'm just going to scroll down to the benchmarks here. These are done on a single Titan X overclocked. And I'm also going to take the overclocked values instead of the stock values because that's what makes most sense. So what I'm going to do is throw these important ones into a chart so we can see a bit more clearly. Right, so the 6700K and the 5820K both reached 4.6 gigahertz with their overclock, whereas the 5960X only reached 4.4 1080p ultra settings. Now at first glance you can see that the blue bar of the 6700K seems to win most of them. There is a pretty small gap there. In Assassin's Creed Unity there's a 5 frames per second gap though that is actually quite a lot for a CPU to be making that kind of difference especially when all of them are overclocked so highly. In Crisis 3, we can see that the 5960X actually ekes out a very small one. One of the problems though is when you're up at 120 plus FPS anyway, you're not that far away from margin of error. Yeah, there's only a couple of percent in there. Now in Grand Theft Auto 5, you can see once again the Skylake CPU wins and the 8-core also does pretty well compared to the 5820K. However, in Far Cry 4, things get a little bit nuts. 126 frames per second for the 6700K compared to only 104 and a half for the 5820K and only 95.4 for the 5960X. Now when I see this happening in a benchmark, the first thing I think is there's something wrong with this benchmark. How exactly can Skylake be 20 to 30% faster than the Haswell eCPUs? It doesn't even have 30% higher IPC, it doesn't have 30% higher clock speed. This should not be possible under any normal circumstance. If I had the equipment myself, I would of course have a closer look at it. But when I looked at the benchmark, it is a driving scene. That may have something to do with it. And this is one of the things about benchmarking games. You do get different results in different parts of the game. I was really curious by this point though, and I had to take a closer look at it. Now over at the tech report, when Skylake first got launched, they also benchmarked Far Cry 4. And you can see here that it is a different scene. Maybe one a bit more reflective of the game itself. And you can clearly see here that all the newest Intel CPUs are running around 100 frames per second. So not entirely sure what's going on there, but this is why I always try to get more than one data point. I'm not saying Eurogamer's benchmark's wrong, but it is highly suspicious to see a gap of 20 to 30% simply based on CPU. That's pretty much unheard of. Back to the benchmarks, we can see that in Shadow of Mordor, Skylake again has a small advantage, and that is also the same in The Witcher 3. Now there is a gap there, there's no denying it, and I don't think anybody ever said that Skylake wasn't a very good gaming CPU, but is it still the smart option looking forward? You know I talk a lot about DX12, yeah? And multi-threading and how it's going to be more important. Well, over at PC World, they have done CPU benchmarks in three DirectX 12 tests. The 3D Mark API overhead feature for DX12 is pretty much a synthetic test. But what they've done here at PC World is they've taken the 8-core, eight 8-hyper-threaded eight CPU and they've turned off hyper-threading to get an 8-core CPU and then they've turned off cores to get 6 cores, 6 hyper-thread and so on and so forth. And here you can see what happens in what is very much a synthetic scenario. There is quite a drop off between four cores and four hyper-threaded cores. So basically the difference between your i5 and your i7. And again, there's a small gap between four hyper-threaded cores and six proper cores. After that, it's pretty much a wash. 
We do, however, finally have something that is not synthetic. We're talking, of course, about Ashes of the Singularity, the first proper DX12 game. And here we can actually see some pretty decent scaling depending on cores. There is a clear difference between four cores and four hyperthreaded cores, and again a clear difference between four hyperthreaded cores and six cores, and it does start to tail off slightly. However, there is an obvious gap. Really, this comes down to, do you take the extra couple of frames per second right now on Skylake, the 6700K, which generally wins by one or two frames, maybe as much as five frames per second in some games, would you take that knowing that as games progress, we're probably going to see a little bit more like this, where the 6 core and the 6 hyper-threaded core is more like 20 frames per second ahead. These are the difficult choices now, and that's why I chose the 5820K in my Buy Smart Guide. It comes down to money, really. You're going to be paying a little bit more for that 5820K because of the platform cost, however, you are getting two extra cores out of it. I just feel that Skylake is still currently overpriced, and for me, I still believe that the 5820K is a smart CPU buy. So now that you've got your big and beefy 6-core CPU, it's going to need a big and beefy cooler to go with it. And one of the most common comments I see in my Buy Smart video is, why are you going with air cooling in a $2,000 PC? I have had the same question multiple times in the same video, and the answer is really simple. The Noctua NHD15 may well be an air cooler, however, it easily matches any water cooling loop out there around the same price. All of these coolers here are around $100. You can see here, over at Relax Tech, that the D15, when pitted against five water-cooled loops, performs very well in terms of temperatures. Now, it's not at the top. In fact, it's right in the middle. Four degrees is actually quite a lot, but you're still talking six to eight degrees for an overclocked 4 790K. That is not a lot. So why would I go with it? Well, this is the reason why. 45 decibels, that is a big difference there. If you look at something like the H100i, 54 decibels, that is loud. One of the problems with the water coolers is you've got to deal with the noise coming from the pump and you've got to deal with the noise from the fan as well. Now, noise is very important to me. And to me, this is what makes the Noctua NHD15 the best cooler on the market. When you compare those temperatures, with how little noise that the cooler creates, this is the one to go for. Now, you can make exceptions in terms of aesthetics. Maybe you want to see the tubes. Maybe you want to see green neon tubes or something. If that's the case, then you go ahead and build it with a water loop. In the case of my 2000 build, I'm looking to build for guys who are not really interested in that sort of thing. They just want to get the best, quietest, good-looking PC that they can get. And for me, the D15 is simply the best cooler out there. No matter which benchmark site you look at, you will see the same results. It is really, really quiet. Right, so here's the big one, 980 Ti or Fury X. For the past year or so, I have been building up this whole DX12 thing. The reason for which was I want people to have all the information at their hands in order to make the kind of choice that they are interested in most. And I had a very strong suspicion that Fury X would overtake the 980 Ti within maybe three, four months. This was maybe nine months ago last year. And to be frank, it just did not happen. Whether AMD has been really slow with drivers, which would not be a surprise, or or more likely, I think there's maybe something just not quite right about Fury X's memory. But as you saw last week, Fury X is now really starting to motor. And we're going to see it perform very, very well under DX12 titles, at least the ones that AMD are heavily involved with. We saw the 980 Ti get absolutely slaughtered in Ashes of the Singularity, even getting beaten by the 390X. This is something that we're going to see every so often, if not in every DX12 game. But here's the thing, it's not even just been DX12 recently. In DX11 games, the Fury X has really started to motor. People are scratching their heads wondering why this is. It could well be that AMD has done something in their drivers. I do talk a lot about NVIDIA's superior DX11 driver. There is a chance there that AMD has finally fixed their DX11 drivers because many of the recent games are showing big increases in performance where cards like, say, the R9390 are consistently beating the GTX 970. And here we can see Fury X beating the 980 Ti again. The suggestion is also there that games built for consoles are more suited to AMD's GCN architecture, which we know is true. So this could be one of the reasons why. And here's yet another recent example, Far Cry Primal, where it takes a massively overclocked EVGA 980 Ti superclock to 1340 megahertz in order to beat the Fury X, which is hanging up there with the Titan X. 
So are we now finally at the stage where we can say Fury X is the smart buy? Well, I think that Fury X is a much smarter buy right now. However, I got burned by this one once before and I'm not going to do it again. Even if Fury X can match the 980 Ti, that overclockability of the 980 Ti remains. Now for sure not every 980 Ti is going to perform like the superclocked EVGA here, but the option still is there. I can't go out and buy a heavily overclocked Fury X. And even when they are overclocked, they don't seem to perform quite as well anyway. The sad fact of the matter is, this has now become a trade-off. I still consider the 980 Ti to be the smart buy, but it's like I said months ago, be prepared to see your card getting demolished in certain games, because this is going to happen, which is why I have been talking about it for so long. That said, we know that Nvidia is capable of doing the same back, and AMD still has a bit to prove. The thing that finally settled it for me was when I remembered an article on Ars Technica, when AMD's CTO, Joe Macri, was talking about the 4 gigabyte limitation. As we all know, Fury X only came with 4 gigabyte of HBM memory. And Joe rightly pointed out that so long as the drivers are there, 4 gigabyte is not really a problem. But just how much of a problem is that going to be? Are you going to buy a high-end graphics card trusting AMD to continue to support it in drivers when their new series is out? For me, they've got an awful lot more to do to gain that trust. It is now getting extremely difficult for guys like me who are trying to give you the best tech advice. You're looking at the two highest-end graphics cards here, and there is nothing but trade-offs all around. The best advice for me is actually do not buy any of these cards if you can avoid it. Try and hold off to the new series of cards, but be aware that the high end here, you could be talking more than six months. If you cannot wait six months to buy a high end graphics card, then I would go with the 980 Ti still. The Fury X is showing a lot of promise, but AMD has to make it come true. And that is how I see it. Now the last thing I'm going to talk about about my 2000 build is some people reckon that I should have gone with the Samsung 950 Pro solid state drive instead of the 850 Evo. And this has been mentioned by one or two guys. Now it is certainly true if you look at stuff like the reading speeds, the writing speeds, in synthetic loads, then for sure the 950 Pro looks like an incredibly fast drive. It is an incredibly fast drive, but anytime I read in tech, the first thing I do is ignore the synthetic benchmarks because they are bullshit. I go to the real world stuff, stuff like boot times. This is what matters to you when you're using an SSD. Here we have the 950 Pro and the 850 Evo with a 0.2 second boot time difference. And here we have a 0.1 second difference the other way around, where the 850 EVO is actually faster than the 950 Pro. Looking at the loading times, the 850 EVO, the 950 Pro, exactly the same. A difference of 0.3 seconds for loading a GIMP image might as well be the same. Loading a spreadsheet, it might as well be the same again. This is the point here. Even when loading games, Tomb Raider, it's actually faster on the EVO. Shadow of Mordor, it's actually quite a lot faster on the EVO. What is that all about? I have got no idea. But what it simply comes down to is the bottleneck is elsewhere. It doesn't matter how fast the 950 Pro is in all these synthetic benchmarks. This is what matters. How quickly does it load games? How quickly does it load Windows? And the answer is not fast enough to justify the extra cost. This is why I went with the 850 EVO. And all these things together are why I called this the smart buyer's high-end 2000 PC build. I didn't just throw a bunch of parts together here and hope that it's stuck. I do actually put some research into these things so that you guys can get the best that you can get for the money you're spending. The last two pieces of hardware I'm going to talk about here are the R9 390 and the GTX 970. It's clearly a hot topic, so now I'm going to look at everything in order to determine which one of these is the smart buy. And here we have the division, where the R9 380X is beating the GTX 970. We also saw this in Ashes of the Singularity. This one was a real surprise to me though, and I wouldn't even like to guess at what is going on there. But we also saw in games like Hitman that the R9 390 is really pulling away. That's only half the story though, because as we know, Nvidia cards overclock much better than AMD cards currently. And if we look at Metro Last Light here, and this is 1440p, where you would normally expect the 390 to have a good lead, and it does when neither are overclocked. However, once you overclock that 970, it does manage to overtake it. And you simply have got to take that into consideration. People buying these cards are probably going to be overclocking them. Maybe you're not going to overclock it this far. But if the 970 is falling away compared to the 390, it can certainly make up the gap with a better overclock. 
It's not going to save it in every game, however. Here we can see another 1300 MHz 970 toiling well behind the 390 once again. And it goes back to what I was talking about, the Fury X and 980 Ti. Whether AMD have fixed up their drivers or whether we are finally beginning to see GCN architecture really start to motor, because of the consoles, whatever the reason is, the 390 now appears to have the general beating of the 970. Now what I talked about with Joe Macri and the Fury X, where he talked about how memory can be optimised in the drivers, the same thing is going to be true for the 970. The problem with the 970 is, as you know, that very slow last half gigabyte of memory. And if you go up to 4K here, you can basically see what happens with the 970's performance tanks down to 16 frames per second. Once again getting beaten by the 380X, it's even getting beaten by the 280X here. If I'm going to say the same thing about AMD not doing it in drivers for Fury X, then I'm certainly going to say the same thing about Nvidia. If ever a graphics card said planned obsolescence, it is the GTX 970. Nvidia sold an awful lot of those cards, and the simplest way to get you to upgrade it is by not optimising for that last half gigabyte of memory. So while AMD might not optimise Fury X due to a lack of resources, Nvidia has other reasons for not optimising the 970 moving forward. For me, that makes it a simple choice. If you're looking to choose between the R9 390 and the GTX 970, go for the R9 390. If you want the really smart option, do not buy either of these graphics cards. With Polaris 10 and 11 due within the next few months, both of these cards are going to look like ancient technology. There are so many variables that you need to take into consideration. The best thing to do is avoid both of these cards like the plague. But if you simply cannot avoid them, then go for the R9 390. Right, so the very last thing I want to talk about in this video, as I almost reach 15,000 subscribers, oh, one more and I'm at 15,000, everybody go run and subscribe again. But the last thing I want to talk about is, in my last DX12 video, I once again railed against Gameworks. And here's the thing, right? I read every single comment that comes in. As long as I can do that, that's what I'm going to continue to do. But there are probably over a hundred comments every day right now. And some of the comments were saying stuff like, I feel bad now after watching your DX12 video. This is guys that have owned some kind of Nvidia card and they're saying that they feel bad because of the stuff that I have been showing in these videos. I just want to say that the very last thing I want you guys to feel is bad <laughs> while watching my videos. That is not what it's all about. Around about two months ago, I almost bought myself a 970. I'm glad I didn't buy it now, but it's not because of Gameworks. And this is really what should matter to you guys. When it comes to stuff like Gameworks, don't feel bad about it. Just let me feel bad about that. I'm the guy that can make the videos pointing out just how bad this stuff is for us overall. But when it comes down to actually buying the technology, you are buying a graphics card, yeah? You're not buying Nvidia's marketing department. So keep that in mind. This is not about making you guys feel bad, but you should never be afraid of more information. No matter how unpleasant and how uncomfortable it might make you feel. Right there, I've gone for the 390. Two months ago, I went for the 970, or I would have done for myself. Because I'm not really interested in having that 390 space heater in my PC, I'm generally a mid-range buyer. 390 is sort of like a high-end card performing like upper mid-range, and the 970 is a mid-range card outperforming itself. That's why they perform so closely, and yet the Nvidia card uses so much less power. What I'm trying to say here is, yeah, Gameworks is an issue. If I bought that 970, I would still have made these videos, yeah? Because Gameworks is an issue for gamers. Buying something like an R9 390 and hastening global warming is also an issue for all of us, yeah? <laughs> so try not to think about it as Nvidia bad, AMD good. Simply look at it as what is the best card you can get for your money and let guys like me deal with Gameworks however we can. So as usual, there's gonna be a bunch of links in the description below, hopefully some lively chat, and hopefully the next video won't be too long in appearing either. Here's to the next 15,000. I'll catch you later, guys.